Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. We're celebrating um, 10 years. And God love you. I'm so proud of you, and I'm so happy about it because it's a good show. show for a absolutely long time. what is it that especially you when I'm on it yeah. <laughs> then I am crazy about it. no it's a good show mm -hmm. and I don't see any bull alive in, in the air I, I think it's all straightforward stuff I think people from the theater are um, they love being honest mm -hmm. you know they don't get the opportunity to do it too many times and it also has to do with the two of you and your attitude because you don't pull punches. Welcome to Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel. We're celebrating our 10th anniversary on 13 by looking back at some of the highlights of our first decade on public television. We've had a lot of fun talking to theater people these past 10 years. Our very first show was an interview with the songwriters John Kander and Fred Ebb. At the time, they were about to open Chicago on Broadway. And we'd like to show you an excerpt from that interview now. Do you guys ever fight? Do you ever fight over a song, over no, a lyric? No. Do you ever tell them, hey, I don't like your melody, hey, I don't like your lyric? Sure, yeah. no, we time. don't fight. But there's no tension there? I mean, you're just... No. No, and there never has been from the very beginning. It's, we, we found this way of working together. We were really sort of fell into it. It's not... I, mean, I think because we're each other's fan. Mm. See, I think John is just a terrific musician and a wonderful composer. And the feeling is... And if I were to say to him, I don't like something. He would know where that, what place that came from, and it's not a harmful place or a hurtful place, or a degrading place. It's just, it's my love for his work mm. says to me, I am allowed to say this to you. If one and of us feels I'm so not jeopardy, yeah, I don't put anything in jeopardy. Right. But I'll tell you something wonderful about him, Julie. The morning after Nick and Nora was beaten beyond death by the critics. Julie called, first thing, and he had one word. He said, next. The morning after Red Shoes, I called him. And before I could say next, he said, I've started. <laughs> and he had. He was, you know, he really was more than a survivor. He was determined. He was absolutely. I mean, they must have had a hell of a time killing him in that hospital, because he was just unkillable. We love to interview British actors. They're very witty and full of anecdotes. We've had a lot on the show over the years, and we're going to show you some of them now. You are pretending, and these are sort of awful words, in a way, to a lot of people who get really into, the, pretend, into the whole bit of the You know, it's really, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just, what is it? It's just, I didn't you know just, he was pretending. Like, look, I'm this, I'm this person. And a part, a part sort of takes you over in a way, and you don't oh, really yeah, know why awful. it's taking you over, or when it's taking you over. So, so therefore, you don't know how you do it. But that, does that, that happen, that you know you're really cooking, when all of a sudden, the the, the character has taken well, a life, takes you life of the it, it can take you a bit by surprise, and you find yourself physicalizing something which you haven't planned to do. That's the truth nice. and the trick yeah. of the moment, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's interesting. But everything you you say sounds sounds you know as if you know, and you don't. No, we don't know. <laughs> so the end, <laughs> you end up sounding pretentious. But when you, you end up sounding but, as if you yeah. really got the answer, and you don't have a clue what's going on. Right? Uh, you told me a story which I would love to get you to tell again about uh, one night on John Gabriel Borkman when the snow machine didn't work. Oh. And it was you, um, uh, ah, Vanessa, Sco and Paul Schofield. And it was sort of an example of three different styles of acting. Uh, we had a big snow scene in John mm -hmm. Gabriel Borkman. And uh, in the interval, the uh, stage manager came around, knocked first of all on my door and said, uh, Eileen, I'm terribly sorry, the snow machine has gone. And so there won't be any snow in that scene. And I really do swear abominably, and I can't do that on television. But I, I was saying the equivalent, I don't believe it. God's sake, this, this is the National Theatre. Nothing works, nothing works. Oh, OK, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. go away. <laughs> I'll manage somehow. She goes to Vanessa's door and she knocks, she says, Vanessa, the snow machine's not working. Oh, isn't it? 
why don't we tear up lots of pieces of paper into time? <laughs> and as I go on stage, they'll be in my pocket and I go, woo, 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 and it'll be like snow. And she goes to Paul's door and she knocks on the door and she says, Mr. Schofield, I'm very afraid the snow machine is not working. He just dumps it. No snow, no Paul. <laughs> 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 they got the snow machine working. <laughs> no, you, you can keep talking. Okay. Okay. I can talk, can I? Yeah, you and were you pleased, they asked, of Helen in hell? <laughs> Was I pleased, she said, that all Troy's towers fell and Priam's sons were slain and lost his throne and such a war was fought shall ne'er be seen again and fought for me alone. Was I pleased? She said, oh, I should think I was. And let's not forget the terrific American actors we've also had on the show. Most actors want to be actors because they do, in fact, want to get away from something painful when they're little, and they do want to hide, and they do want love and affection that they're not getting somewhere else. Actors will tell you that they did it for the craft. Most of the time, you, don't, you really do it for the attention and the affection. And what you do is you create somebody. I, in fact, created somebody quite different than myself as a boy and as a young man. And I had great success with that person that I created. But now I'm in my 60s, and mm -hmm. who wants to carry that burden around with them? Now what you really want as you get older and closer to the end is you want to be known. You know, you really do. And you want to be known in the most pure, honest way, not in some image. For me, everything about being an actress has to do with the play and the writer of the play. And if the writer is living, I want the, the play's life, if it begins in New York City, it can be a launching pad. Mm -hmm. you, God knows I've, with you. you know, I've done, I've made all those mistakes in my life anyway as an actor. I mean, I've done every shitty ass TV show and, <laughs> and uh, you know, police woman and whatever, you know, because in those days, of course, I was trying to put my kids through college. Right. So that's my excuse. So I'm Do, sick let me it. ask you, does doing that kind of work, police woman, whatever it is, does it take its toll on you as an artist? Well, it does if you let it. Okay. What happens, I see it happen time and time again, not just with marginal performers, but with stars. They go to Hollywood, they make a lot of money, and they get offered a lot of money, and that's what they do. Um, and, you know, I mean, you're working, you know, you work six or eight weeks on a movie, and you're getting, no, those guys, not me, I mean, enormous amounts of money. And, and you know, I mean, the, the interesting thing about the movie business is they treat you like you're four years old. You know, the car will be there to pick you up at 6.30 in the morning, please be ready. And, you know, here you, you're expected to get your ass to rehearsal on time, you know, and learn your lines. I mean, you have to be like an adult in the, in the theater business, but in the movie business, you're a baby. If you're a neurosurgeon, you know that if, unless you leave an instrument in somebody's brain, you're pretty much going to have work. But you can be the best writer, director, choreographer, actor in the world, and, uh, and, and next year they might say, you know, uh, we're going another direction. <laughs> You're funny, but uh, we've cast Nell Carter. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's so little security in the world. And, and, and when, when the biggest stars can have huge flops, uh, this, this breeds a lot of, uh, of um, contempt. It breeds a lot, a lot of nervousness, and, and what that means is people get uh, vicious. They say in the theater that the writer is the king. We've had a lot of writers on the show over the years. Here are some of them. I write my plays to find out why I'm writing them. <laughs> that simple. Yeah. What I don't do, and what I discourage my playwriting students from doing, <coughs> is getting a thesis and then trying to find characters to, uh, uh, to, to right. people yeah. it and, 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 and to move the action forward. No. Uh, I think plays usually, I've talked to a lot of playwrights about this, most of us don't know where they came from. I talked to Sam Beckett about it. It shows up. I'm there to write it down. I'm very interested in, in the way that people who have resources intellectual resources or um, personal resources of charisma or strength respond to a situation in which those tools don't serve them anymore. Mm. So I wanted to show somebody going from great strength and gradually becoming weaker and weaker, not in herself, but through <coughs> a change of setting. Are you writing something new now? No. No. Will you? I mean, are you now going to be, give up kindergarten teaching and become a professional playwright? 
No. That's not what you wanted? No. No. It's no. just this came out of you that, yeah. this came out of you and now you're done and. Yeah, I'm, I'm a teacher. Really, you're not yeah. gonna, you know, you're now a great American playwright and you're not going to uh, join the ranks of uh, <laughs> Edward Albee and Eugene O'Neill. <laughs> this is just what you had to say and that's. Yeah, if I have something else to say in 10 years, I'll say it, but you get but more I'm, plays to direct before I'm, the next <laughs> one. No, and it's very funny when we talk about it because Derek says, "Well, we might move the play, and it might move to this theater and that theater." And I say, "I've got a government job. I don't care what you do." <laughs> <laughs> so what you're dealing with in the play is not just the events themselves, but the response of the audience to those events. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make it like a Greek theater, in other words, like a like a public forum, like a town hall meeting, in which suddenly the action of the play would be interrupted by people who objected essentially to both what the play was saying and even to the fact that the play was going on at all. Mm -hmm. So somebody very early on gets up and says, you're a load of smug liberals, you're all sitting here <laughs> listening to exactly what you want to hear. And well, Whitaker. You know already, <laughs> you know. And as soon as you do that, you speak to what it is that is half on the audience's mind. Right. And you immediately begin to create once I found that technique, what I call the interventions, mm. that break up the narrative of the play, then I knew I could write the play. That's how I knew it. That was the method by which I wrote it. Are you happy with the amount of uh, attention that uh, playwrights are getting from the mainstream media when they put up shows? Um, no, I, I feel like there's a real, um, there's a real cutthroat kind of uh, take on new plays and new voices right now. And I also think that um, there's a sort of, um, a lack of writing about liter theater, theater as a literature, and it's more about consumer advoca advocacy. It's more about how am I going to tell these people to spend their forty or eighty-five bucks? Um, well, that's for the New York Times approach nowadays. I, I, seen, yeah. I think so. Yeah. To me, that doesn't create a conversation about th about theater as a culture. It creates right. sort of consumer advocacy. How am I going to spend my fifty bucks? We've also had a number of colorful characters on the program, including some with purple hair. Yeah, it looks like you're under construction. <laughs> I should have a fence around me. <laughs> <laughs> You're like Puff Daddy. You have a groom squad. Puff, yeah, what? Puff, 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 Puff Daddy was here. He came with his groom, groom squad, squad as well. A groom squad? He actually had, we had to wait for about a half an hour before. What do they do to him? We don't know. Well, they I know what they private do. private like that. Like. He was in between whatever it is he does during his day, so he came here. We had to wait here uh, while he had his hair trimmed because he travels with his own barber. As you do too. Well, it looks like it. <laughs> I've never met this person before. <laughs> I mean, I come into a studio and these teasers are stalking me. <laughs> Groomers and teasers. Do you know what's afflicted me in the last two days? Toothache. My dental history is a separate interview. <laughs> but I have had a bit of work no. Susan. No. You're kidding. And I had this dreadful toothache on stage. Really? Now, I keep hoping that that old Dr. Footlights is going to fix me up. You know, <laughs> you know about Dr. Footlights? It's Dr. Footlights. It's an, sort of an English thing. An Australian, I suppose. You walk on stage with whatever ailment or worry, and the footlights fix it. Poof, it's gone. I think it's to do with a rush of adrenaline. <laughs> so I was hoping Dr. Footlights, dentist Footlights, would fix my tooth. And? Are we doing all this tonight? No, no, we're going to... <laughs> I haven't seen you on the circuit, though, Bob, because, you know, the History Boys, the cast of the History Boys, I used to see them at all the theater bars yeah. like Angus Mackendo, which is just down the they street from where swath, you are. Yeah. Oh, you don't, you don't know the dummy bars. Uh, <laughs> 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 we got some bars, man. They got some stuff. They got wood alcohol. Wow. Oh, man, I love it. <laughs> What's a dummy bar like? I don't know a dummy bar. <laughs> well, you should go with me sometime. Yeah. You know, you've been hanging around places. <laughs> a dummy bar, man, they'll make you, they'll make you look cross-eyed. <laughs> it is, is a typical night at the dummy bar. What? Typical night? Yeah. Two drinks and here's what you do. <laughs> <laughs> do you like it? Oh, did that hurt? Yeah, yeah. yeah that hurt. Huh? That's it. Get that's back. A, yeah, 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 we're going right there. That's a, gotta tell, that's a good trick, actually. Yeah, you don't see that? Yeah, try it. We don't have too many guests on Theater Talk who can do that one. I it's, it's something the kids like. This is The Exorcist. Yes. <laughs> yeah, they love that. Because okay, I'll just okay. ramble on and they really want to get to the heart of the matter. <laughs> and so 
Hi, uh, <coughs> how are you? Okay. <laughs> Hello, Rose. It's wonderful to be here. Listen, uh, I didn't see either of you at the theater. If I had seen you, I would have come and said hello. Sarah's terrible. You know, she doesn't come take care of people. But I'm so <laughs> glad you came because my name is Lorraine. Uh, and there's a, a common idea that, you know, we as a country have to be afraid of the immigrants. But then you forget somebody like me, an older lady, not so old, don't give me that look. But, you know, an older lady like me, I'm coming from an immigrant background. I was very, very little when I came in the 30s. But still, that all of us can share in the immigrant story. That's the idea. An interesting I just want to show, see time warp you out of here. You are going to be waiting. Time warp You're going to be once. waiting for Godot, Stand my dear, up and by do the time it you see Right now, come on, my <laughs> Come on, it's just a jump to the left. Come on, we're going to get him to do this yet. Come on, it's, it's just, just a jump to the left. Left, 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 Michael, like, your other left. I feel it's a step to the right. See you next time. I feel it's just a time on This is a culture show. I feel it's my favorite thing on this show is when guests come and confront Michael Riedel for things he has written in his column in the New York Post. She just loves that. When yes, they beat me I up. do. For instance, here is the producer Cameron McIntosh a few years ago when he was in town reviving the mega hit Oklahoma. I read in someone's column about some of the uh, cuts that are being made to um, Oklahoma because it was running a little long, about three hours and 25 minutes. And uh, you brought in uh, Susan Stroman to uh, help Trevor Nunn cut the show. Was that correct? Well, the thing is, there was a rookie reporter working on a paper this morning that completely um, uh, misrepresented the normal process that happens with a musical, which is you get on the first preview and then the director, the producer and the choreographer discuss what cuts were made. And uh, within about four days of the first preview of Oklahoma, we'd managed to cut 15 to 20 minutes out of it. So mm -hmm. it's now running sort of healthily under the three hours um, and not, as you reported this morning, that it... Uh, uh, didn't happen to last week, and it was done solely by Susan Strayman. Now, the show ran, though, over three hours, uh, I remember, in London. Do you think that uh, New York... All shows run over three hours well, at the National Theatre. Yeah, did you feel that some of the things that I wrote in the Post were, uh, were, were unfair and unjust? Well, I mean, I think I think I've sort of questioned your agenda, because it, it seems that... You know, I, as I said earlier, I write for a newspaper, and I, I always write about shows, and I go and do the, a similar thing to what you do, maybe not on such a big scale. And, you know, I think we're all entitled to our opinion. But when you start going around saying that other people shouldn't enjoy that particular show or record, then I think you're in dangerous territory because we are entitled to our opinion. And I think where taste is concerned, we're all irrational. If you carry on attacking anything that's <laughs> new and different on Broadway, it is going to frighten people away. And people won't want to come and do kind of unusual shows. And you'll always get the Andrew Lloyd Webbers and the Aidas. I call that a hater. <laughs> <laughs> You're just going to get that same old thing. And it's, it's also, you know, it contradicts this kind of idea that, you know, people are kind of passionate about saving live theatre. Oh, life is good, Harvey. <laughs> life is what, you know, um, the, uh, yeah. Life yeah. is really good. Yeah. And you're Life terrific really in Fiddler good. on the Roof. And everybody's doing fine. Hairspray's doing fine. It's such a good thing. Now, just stop being so evil. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Harvey. Harvey right. Firestein, wonderful as Tevye in Fiddler on the Roof. But he wrote two nice columns this week. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we like to pull out the knives here on Theater Talk. Well, you do. I often have help with critics. <laughs> we have critics panels all the time on Theater Talk. We've uh, made use of some of the best critical minds working in the theater today. Take a look. Everybody on Broadway is talking about In My Life, if not the show itself, this uh, monumental, some would say insane ad campaign that has been mounted to save the show, which uh, was panned by the critics, uh, most of the critics, except for one notable exception. Dave Richardson of WOR Radio, welcome to Theater Talk. Thank you very much. People have been laughing about this show, making fun of this show, and you, Dave, are out there on your own in the pages of the New York Times, I think three pages on a Sunday, reprinting your whole review. And does it embarrass you at all? Not in the slightest. I read all the reviews. You know, obviously, I woke up the next morning thinking that somebody might agree with me. I mean, I, I was stunned by that because we had such a good time. We saw it the night before it opened. I then went back and saw it the night it opened, by the way. We invited the, them to the And the first act happened to be flat opening night. I'm going, oh, my That's heavens. Right. The first, this first act is, is a bomb right. here. You're right. Oh, my heavens. I'm serious. He's right. I it said, was. Whoa. What are you talking the first act? The show has no intermission. <laughs> you're right I'm about a show you tell me it's got a first the act. Were I you paying stop, attention stop, when you were stop. there? Yes. The reason I said that I had to leave in the middle of it, I had oh, to go review oh, another show. Oh, I'd oh, already oh, seen oh, it. Oh, Sorry. No. Tell us about the actual process of writing your reviews. Now, in the old days, critics 
went oh, for yeah. the opening night, and they ran up the aisle, and they banged him out in an hour. Well, actually, uh, Brooks Atkinson, Joe Lelyveld, was, who is now the editor-in-chief of the Times, was Brooks Atkinson's copy boy, huh? and told me I, uh, that he would take the copy to be set every night. And I said, what was it like? Was he frantic? He said, oh, no, not at all. He would walk in, light his pipe, smoke it for, which one could do in those days, smoke <laughs> it for a few minutes, and then he would write everything out in longhand wow. on yellow legal pad paper and would write one page, and Joe would take that, and that would be set, but never changing. I mean, wow. he wouldn't go back and say, I'm going to you know, uh, put this in the lead, move this around. Uh, I mean, to be that thorough. A lot of our top directors now in the musical theater uh, have not had very much experience working with new musicals. I mean, new musicals mm. take forever to get on, mm. and there are very few of them coming along. I think it's terribly sad, this. There is no reason in the world why a musical should take 10 years uh, to get on. All that means is that uh, by the time, uh, if you were George Gershwin, by the time you get your first show on, you'd be dead. <laughs> and um, <coughs> That's true. It's, never, it's never going to work. You're never going to have a viable theater like that. In a sense, uh, the Disney way uh, is the quickest way. If you're someone like Stephen Schwartz, who wrote Godspell, or, or Tim mm -hmm. Rice and Elton John, it's actually quicker to go to Disney, get them to make a cartoon movie <laughs> of the thing, <laughs> and then adapt it for the stage a couple of years later. Yeah, you'll I be mean, in town in three years. <laughs> that's right. And that is, so uh, using the motion picture business as, a tr as the new tryout is actually <laughs> far more efficient. Yeah. Well, Michael, we're celebrating our 10th uh, year on Channel 13 with Theatre Talk, and I know that you're a devoted fan of the show. What, what is it that makes Theatre Talk so important in your life? Um, what was the next question? No, what was important to you about the last 10 years of theatre? I do love Theatre Talk, and I do watch it religiously because, you know, it's lively, it's perky. And you're on it. <laughs> and I'm on it. <laughs> and uh, as far as Broadway, I'm thinking back over the last 10 years, my favorite moments were from revivals, because that's what Broadway does best, I think, and Death of a Salesman with Brian Dennehy, oh, who yeah, was yeah. not typically cast as this downtrodden Willie Loman, I thought was the most powerful thing I've ever seen. Now, Jeremy, you were, uh, you, I think you were in college when Theater Talk first, uh, first I came on the air 10 years ago. Right. But in the time that you have been reviewing First for the Sun now for New York Magazine, what was a highlight uh, of, of that period for you on Broadway? A highlight, one that comes to mind is uh, John Doyle's Sweeney Todd, mm -hmm. uh, which I saw, I don't know, 18 times or something. And there's a sense in which it's, I know that approach has been done before, and, you know, people have tried it. But there's a way in which I thought he really distilled exactly what Sondheim was trying to do there. It's a reinvention or a revival of a Stephen Sondheim masterpiece, right? You've then got that, that it's a British director. That's kind of, you know, the British or the European aesthetic meeting the American aesthetic is, is kind of interesting. Watching it, you think, well, why aren't there more like this? Yeah. this and is a viscerally exciting Broadway musical yeah. uh, by the man who's supposed to be too cerebral and everything else. And, and part of the reason, I think, is it just has that incredible sense of theatricality. And of course, the moment. Tony went to the pajama game. So, Michael, thank you very much. Thank you to our viewers and to our crew and everybody. I'm thinking see of getting you. a new co-host for the next 10 years, so <laughs> Susan's days may be numbered. <laughs> we'll see you on our regular time, Fridays, 12.30 a.m. on 13. And visit our website, www.theatertalk.org, to find out our other airing times. Good night. We're dedicating this program to our friend Bob Fennell, one of the theater's great press agents who died last month of cancer. Here he is at his diplomatic best in the 1997 D.A. Pennebaker Chris Hedges documentary, Moon Over Broadway. I'm Bob Fennell, the real honest to God. Impressive. Impressive. My problem is, though, that I meant to play all day. It's just me. Okay. Hold on one second. I have a better ticket for you. Okay. Should I go back and tell Beckler, or do you want to go back? Sure. You, okay. Thanks. He's going to go back and just tell the stage manager a little press room. This is a, this is a picture of Carol Burnett. She approved this photo, but when she did, I said to her... Oh, look! <laughs> we need to do something about this picture. Why? Because everybody hates it. Really? Three people have come up to me and have gone, you're a much prettier girl Oh, we'll show you what else we have. I would love to. I think I have it. photo approval in my contract. I... I don't know, but I'll check out. But look, the dress isn't the right color. There's a crease in it. And I'm talking. I'm going like this. Look, my mouth is like this. All right, I'll take a look at what else it's we have, and we'll pick something else. very attractive. Okay. I mean, it's not horrible, but it's not 
I think I'm more attractive than that, and I'm supposed to be the beautiful girl in the show. Well, we'll look at we'll look at everything we have, and you'll help me pick it. Cool. Okay. Thanks. All right. So much. Have a good show. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 Uh, we're celebrating uh, 10 years of theater talk, and one of our most um, fanatical fans who I think <laughs> has seen every episode is Paul Rudnick, who's also been on the show a number of times. Paul, can you tell us um, uh, how and why you value theater talk so highly? <laughs> well, when I was a child in New Jersey watching theater talk, <laughs> I had a dream. <laughs> that was, I think, when Michael was still hosting with Kathy Lee. But I just started doing that morning cooking show together. No, I, as as a diehard theater person, I have always been so hugely grateful to have a television show <laughs> devoted to theater. Anything. It's, it's so rare and so welcome <laughs> that I think everyone in theater is profoundly grateful to either appear on or watch. Um, theater talk. Even I think when it's Michael's horrible and mean. Especially. <laughs> Please. <It's a> <laughs> What's Christmas without the Grinch? <laughs> Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. Playbill Online is the official website of Theater Talk and the home of the Playbill Club, providing information and opportunities for theater lovers. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night.